the T tensor. The reason is that you remember yesterday, we started from a gauge invariant Lagrangian, which was not supersymmetric. LG naught. And uh, the variation, we can verify that the variation uh, of this uh, Lagrangian with respect to the supersymmetry no, was proportional to some uh, f, or call it tm, uh, call it f, m times. Uh, T phi theta times a fermion by linear. Okay, this is very schematic, very schematic. Okay, so the variation, specific variation of uh, of uh, this Lagrangian, okay, was not zero due to the minimal couplings which which, which broke explicitly. <coughs> Okay, and what you found that was that the variation. What you can find is that the variation depends uh, on the uh, on the embedding tensor through the detection. Okay, so what you do is you add these uh, extra terms, you know, delta LG one plus delta LG two plus additional terms, the uh, supersymmetry transformation of the fermion fields, depending on these. Uh, the H tensors, which are S, uh, N, and M, okay? And so you end up with a Lagrangian, a gauge Lagrangian, which has to be gauge in supersymmetry invariant, invariant and the supersymmetry. Now you can verify that the variation of this has the form of, uh, say, it's the form of uh, this Fm. Uh, then you have Tn, the T tensor. But then you have, let me write it in a very, very uh, schematic way, S terms N and N as well. Fermions. This is a fermion. I'm writing it in a very schematic way. Okay, these are the new terms, or the G, or the G, or the G. These are the new terms which arise from our modifications, like this, this uh, additional term to the Lagrangian and the additional term to the supersymmetry transformation law. Now this has to be zero. This means that the new tensors, which are H tensors that you introduce in these additional terms and in the supersymmetry transformation laws of the fermion fields must cancel T, the T tensor. But this can occur only if T contains inside only the H representations corresponding to S, N, and M, and nothing else. So this is a constraint. How do, how do we realize this? Well, how do we check this? We know that the T tensor Transforms under H if if we transform theta and phi simultaneously. However, if we just transform theta and not phi, well then this transforms under G. Why? Because this is a, this is a. Um, Transforms like uh, or with the definition L minus one phi G uh, L phi times T of phi. Uh, so you see that if we transform uh, uh, only theta, but we keep phi fixed, so we keep we keep ourselves on the same point in the, in the manifold. You can verify from the very definition of T, uh, which is there, I guess, okay, that T transform under this, which is a, a, a transformation in G. Depending on phi, as a transformation in G. <coughs> so formally, T belongs to R of theta. 
because it's not what we have done in the, for defining t is dressing theta, which is the, which transforms in the representation out of theta is a g object by means of the coset representative, which is a g transformation. So formally, t is also in the same representation as the embedding tensor and satisfies the same constraint as the embedding tensor because its t is obtained by dressing the embedding tensor by means of a g transformation. And all the constraints on the embedding tensor are equivalent. So this is clear. But as an H object, this representation decomposes with respect to H because H is a smaller group. And in general, we contain the representation of S plus the representation of the tensor N plus the representation of the tensor M plus other things. Now, in order for this constellation to occur, it cannot contain any other thing. And this amounts to constraint on the tensor and also these S and M representations. So SUS invariance implies that this cannot occur. Of course, here I include also the conjugate representations, OK? And uh, you can verify that this is, uh, corresponds precisely to, to the con on the embedding tensor to this condition. This is why this condition here, the linear constraint, which is a representation constraint, is also related to the supersymmetry invariance of the theory. It tells us that T, the D tensor, which, is, uh, which uh, encodes all, uh, well, in terms of which all variations of the original Lagrangian, the age Lagrangian, these are written cannot contain terms which cannot be cancelled by the, 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 the furnishing tensors, okay? Okay. So, uh, good, so we have recast uh, the condition, the consistency condition for the gauge loop, the choice of the gauge loop in terms of uh, um, G covariant conditions. So the idea is that provided we, we find a solution to these constraints, okay, there are infinitely many solutions to these constraints, once we find a solution to this constraint, eta and alpha solution to linear and constraints. We know from the locality constraint that uh, there exists a electric frame in which theta lambda alpha is equal to zero. Then we rotate to this frame, and we proceed as, the, as we described yesterday. Okay, we perform the gauging in the electric frame. <coughs> okay. Now we want to go one step further. There any questions? We want to go one step further. We want to free ourselves from this last step. That is, we want to perform a gauging, construct the gauge superiority in a frame which is not the electric frame of the appendix tensor. This is now the main objective. Okay? Now later I will give you also some examples uh, in some case supergravity of these representations. Okay? But let me discuss this point which I think is a, a good last uh, topic for these lectures. So we want now to define a duality covariant gauging. That is gauging in a generic frame which is not in 
in general, the electric frame of the turbine. Okay. As we shall see, uh, something interesting will come out from 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 this. Okay. When trying to construct this theory. So, where do we start from? In order to construct this theory, we start we start from the gauge connection. Okay. So we start defining a gauge connection, uh, which is equal to theta a m mu theta uh, x in x m. That is g a lambda mu x lambda plus a lambda mu x lambda. Okay. We write the connection as we wrote before. Okay. Uh, now, for the sake of simplicity, since G always multiplies the gauge generators, okay. Now we already discussed the the, 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 the supersymmetry um, uh, uh, variation of the, of the of the action and how to construct the supersymmetric action, which can be which has to be done. <coughs> Identically in the powers of G. Now we can we don't need G anymore. So we can reabsorb G in a definition of uh, of X. Okay. The end. Uh, the embedding tensor contains everything, all parameters, including G. Okay. So G was just a convenient introduced for convenience. So we just reabsorb it in X. So what is the difference with respect to the last our uh, our previous uh, uh, treatment? Okay. We know that we can always write this thanks to the locality condition in this form, where this is the electric frame of the embedding tensor. We can always write this in this form. What we have learned to do so far is to construct the gauging in a, a gauge supergravity in which these were the electric phase strengths. So, so the electric vector phase to be described within the Lagrange, that is within the net terms and all that. Okay? This is what we learned so far. Now, what we want to do is, although we can always write this in this way, is to construct a gauge of the in which the electric vector fields are these ones. That is, in which these are the, the vector fields, elementary vector fields, described locally in the Lagrangian. Okay? So you see that the minimal coupling involves not only the electric vector fields of uh, the symplectic frame we're working in, okay, which are described locally in the ground, but also their magnetic tools. Okay? So this is the difference. We don't go to the electric frame, we do the gauging here. And these are going to be our elementary fields. So, we start from uh, omega and we construct the field strength following the same steps as we did yesterday. How do we construct the field strength? Okay, <clears throat> so 
uh, what's wrong with this? Well, you can verify that the Bianchi identity are not satisfied. Moreover, there's another problem with this. FM do not transform under a gauge transformation in a covariant table. In general, we can have, and we have, a symmetric part of this tensor in the lower indices. But once we contract with another generator, this is zero. Okay, this is an important consequence. Then, let us now anti-symmetrize in uh, three indices. Okay? M, P, and N, this guy here. So, if we anti-symmetrize, this is in M, P, and N, by this symbol, I mean we anti symmetrize in these three indices. And mm -hmm. these two, they simply sum up. And then they get this one. We get another thing. And we get another condition, which is this one. Twice x m p. Are X and R S anti symmetrizing MP and N is equal to 
minus x m n r x r p s. Okay. Okay, now what we do is we write this guy here as, uh, so let me just change here to the position, N and D, so I get the plus here, okay? Okay, let us write this as, and this one, uh, the, sum, uh, of, uh, uh, the sum of the symmetric part and the symmetric part. We do also like the same here. Summing this, uh, writing this tensor as the sum of the tensor in which these two indices are asymmetrized, plus the same tensor in which these two indices are symmetrized. So, PR S, I write it as X, PR S plus X, PR S. Okay, this is what we do. Let's do it here, let's do it here as well. Okay, and then let's put to the left. Everything, all the terms which contain the one with the anti-symmetrized anti lower indices, and to the right, the terms containing the, the symmetrized one. Okay? So what we end up with is the following. X, M, N, R, X, P, R, S, is equal to minus one third X, M, N, where these are anti-symmetrized, and M, N, R, X, P, R, S, where this is anti-symmetrized, M, N, on both sides, okay? But now, you can see that this is, this case, the, third, the right, right hand side can be written as the Jacobinator, that is the combination of the structure constant which should be zero if the Jacobi identity were to hold, but which is not zero. So we can write this in this form here. X and B are X and R S minus X and B are X and R S, okay, plus X, M, N, R, X, R, B, S, this is equal to, this is not zero, but this is equal to X, M, N, R, X, P, R, S. So, these are the structure constants. Now, symplectically covalent structure constants, okay? And you see that they do not satisfy the Jacobi because the third right hand side will be with zero, the Jacobi density. They do not satisfy. The obstruction to the Jacobi identity is proportional to this tensor here, which is nothing but the symmetry one, the X tensor with the symmetrized lower indices. The same tensor that we have shown before to be zero if contracted with the H. The same. So you see that if we contract S with the gauge generator XS, so the free index S, we contract with the an X. And we contract this times an excess, well, this would be zero because of this. Okay? So now you see that this condition here 
is telling us something. It's telling us that there are some of the parameters, of the two and B parameters in this redundant formulation, there are some of these two and B parameters which are unaffected as gauge transformation. Maybe do not occur as gauge parameters. If contracted with the gauge generators, they simply be zero. So there is a, a part of this parameter space of gauge parameters, okay, so this is the vector space of the gauge parameters, which will never occur in a gauge transformation because they just disappear when we contract them with a gauge generators. Okay? And this is a typical thing, I mean this is a characteristic thing of uh, this new formulation, namely the Jacobi identity does not hold, but up to a tensor which vanishes when contracted with the generator. That is, the Jacobinator has values in this uh, subspace of the gauge parameter space describing uh, uh, trivial transformations. In a, uh, yes. Okay. Now we can also verify that uh, uh, these field strengths do not just form covariantly and uh, that they don't satisfy uh, the Bianchi identity. Now I give you as an exercise, but this is a good exercise using the, the identities that, that we just derived, okay? We can verify that the Fm, which is defined as D A M, uh, sorry, sorry, D M plus A M X N of uh, P M F P. Okay? There's a wedge here. If you write this down explicitly, you see that this is not zero. But this is X M R M A M D A R plus one third X P Q R a P, wedge A Q. So the Bianchi identity is not satisfied. Well, this comes, comes with no surprise somehow because uh, our embedding tensor has magnetic components. In our framework, in our in our symplectic frame, the magnetic components of the embedding tensor, which are like magnetic charges, are different from zero. So we would expect the Bianchi identities not to be satisfied. However, you see, the Bianchi identities, well, the abstraction to the Bianchi identities is proportional to the same tensor, which is the tensor X with symmetrized lower indices. Okay? So only some of these Fn do not satisfy the Bianchi identities. And those are those which, whose value is precisely in this subspace of the parameter space, of the gauge parameter space, defining unaffected gauge transformations. Indeed, if we consider the, the if we consider the Bianchi identity, only for those vector fields which are involved in the, in the minimal couplings, well, then we find that the Bianchi identities are satisfied. So everything is consistent because those vector fields which are involved in the minimal couplings, they are well defined. And this, this is the, the necessary condition for the theory to be physically viable. And how do we see that? Well, these are the vector fields which are involved in minimal couplings, those which are contracted by the gauge generators. Now we can take the corresponding field strengths and see if they uh, satisfy the architect. And you see that this is proportional to its x uh, uh, m r m x times this times x m. Now you see that this contraction is zero. This follows from the quadratic constraints. So it's true that for all these uh, redundant sets of vector fields, the identities are not satisfied. 
but for those vector fields which enter the gauge connection, so which enter uh, the minimal coupling, the Bianchi identities are satisfied. And this is important because these have to be well defined. These are the vector fields entering the, uh, uh, with the known derivative inside the diagram. So these vector fields have to be well defined. And uh, we see that their Bianchi identities are satisfied. Okay? Uh, variation of uh, gauge variation of the field strength. Gauge variation of the field strength. Now we see that we're going to have a non uh, non combining gauge variation. Because if we bind the FM, I suggest you to do this exercise. What you do, what you find, is the covariant derivative of delta n minus x and b and a n delta a b. This is an exercise you can easily do. Okay? This is the variation with respect to generic variation of a. Now let's make a gauge variation. Under the gauge variation, the variation of A, okay, A in the vector field transform, will be, uh, let's call them like this, covariant derivative of the gauge generators. Okay? So if we plug this here, what we find is that delta Fm is equal to d squared x and m, x again. Minus x and b and a and that I think here I can substitute the value. But let, let us compute delta squared, delta squared by which identity can be written as f and x and p and psi p minus plus m b m a n then a okay now this is not the variation the correct variation of uh, the covariant variation of m what would be the covariant variation of m you see the covariant variation of m of m of, of sorry of f covariant of f m would be Minus psi d x p and m f n. This would be the covariant variation. Now you may say, okay, but if I swap these two indices with a minus, I get the right variation. Unfortunately, these two indices are not anti-symmetric. This is the main point. They're not anti-symmetric. So this is not equal to this. So you see, we in order to rewrite this in a covariant way, so
But you see that the, the, the difference between uh, the F variation and the covariant variation is a term which is proportional to the same answer. X, the tensor X is symmetrized and it's lower in this system. Okay? So, in order to cancel these terms and define some covariant field strengths, okay, we combine in a new field strength, which I call HM, our non abelian field strengths with two folds. The alpha. Now we have to think of this as anti-symmetric tensors, rank two anti-symmetric tensors. Okay? So we combine these field strengths, not being fixed, that we did with this rank two tensors. How many? Well, alpha runs from one to the dimension of G. So these are naturally associated with transform naturally in the adjoint representation because this tensor set is defined this way. One half, theta and alpha. Okay. Z is a tensor depending on theta, linear in theta, okay? So it transforms in the same representation of theta. And you see it uh, intertwines between F and in this way, in a natural way. Let's see that If we add this tensor, this uh, this cutting here, of the field strength to the rank two tensors, the resulting field strengths H are covariant. So if we vary H M, okay, if we compute the variation of H M. This is the variation of f plus one half theta m alpha variation of e alpha. Okay? Now, variation of f we have computed it here. Let's write it in this way. It's x m p m f n psi d. Okay? Uh, minus M P M A M delta A. Okay, and this is the second term plus plus one half theta M alpha delta B alpha. Now let us see that this tensor here can be expressed in terms of this theta. Okay? So these uh, uh, additional terms can all be expressed in terms of a single tensor, characteristic tensor Z, times the variation. Okay? Let's prove this. To prove this, we use the um, The linear constraints and the quadratic constraints. The linear constraints are x, m, and p equal to zero. This implies that x, m, and p is equal to minus one half x, p, m, n. Notice that. This tensor here is symmetric in the last two indices because xp mn is nothing but theta p alpha, embedding tensor in which we have raised the symplectic index times t alpha mn. But t alpha mn being t alpha symplectic is symmetric in these in in indices once we lower both of them. So this, uh, this is symmetric in these two indices. Okay? What is this? Well, this is equal to minus one half theta p alpha t alpha m. And this is equal to, this is what we call z, minus z d 
alpha t alpha and then okay so we will see that all the terms which do not fit the covariant variation of our h are all proportional to this second tensor z what is a, a general feature of this tensor z well if we contract this tensor z in its um, symplectic index by theta, we can see because this is one half theta m alpha theta m beta, and this is zero because of the locality constraint. <coughs> so we have defined the z tensor, this one, which, if contracted by theta, gives zero. Okay. This is important. Okay. So let us now towards another step. Fm X M P N or So you can replace in the first term f with h for free, thanks to the quadratic constraint. Okay? Okay. So we can replace here f with h. Then as we did before, we write this as minus the tensor with the, the two lower indices inverted plus twice the symmetric part just as we did before and we get minus at h psi n psi e x d n m h n minus now this term here this one we're going to write it as z minus z t alpha t alpha n. Okay. So plus z m alpha t alpha m p a m delta a. Okay. Plus plus. There's also another term coming from here when we symmetrize twice Z 
So this is the key point in our in our group of covariance. We have seen that f is not covariant, does not change covariant, transform covariant. We have additional terms. But these can addition, these additional terms are all proportional to the same tensor. And they can, can be disposed of by choosing a variation of a suitable variation of So our final result is HM is equal to minus A H psi P X P N M H N. This is the covariant variation. Plus Z M alpha times delta B alpha um, plus T alpha M N uh, and P A N delta P. Okay? Minus T alpha and P psi P H uh, N. Okay? And that's it. Now we want this to be, we want this to be minus psi P X P N. H N. So we want this to be a, a, a covariant variation. So you see, we can choose delta p alpha so as to cancel these two terms. So we see, you see that we need a two form to which we assign a transformation law with respect to the gauge, uh, gauge group, gauge transformations, so that all the non-covariant terms are cancelled. Okay, so T minus T alpha and P A N uh, plus T alpha and P psi P psi N or H P. Okay? Plus possible terms which when contracted with Z are zero, because we just need that this guy here is zero. Okay. So we need, to, in order to define uh, covariant this uh, we need to couple our one form to the to the tensor fields. Okay. And we can do that because the non-covariant terms in the variation of, the, of our distance were all proportional to this characteristic tensor Z, which, when contracted with theta, is zero. Okay? Are there questions? So this is the first step of what is called the tensor hierarchy. That is the consistent uh, selective coupling of P forms to higher order forms through the embedding tensor, okay? which is needed for the covariance of of the theory with respect to the invariance of the theory with respect to the gauge group. Okay? Then we can compute the Bianchi identity. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Uh, the, the characteristic tensor Z is related or linearly or proportional to the embedding tensor theta, right? Precisely. And their contraction is supposed to be zero? Yes, because of the, because of the quadratic constraint. Z and alpha, this is equal to one half C M N theta <coughs> and alpha. You see, this is linear in theta. Moreover, it's expressed in terms of theta through tensors which are invariant with respect to G. So Z is in the same representation as theta. But, but, if we contract Z out with theta, you see there is a C tensor here. 
So what we end up with is one half theta alpha m c m n theta m theta. <coughs> what is this? This is the locality constraint. So this gives zero. It's one of the other constraints. Okay? So this is important. This is important. And if we write down the uh, Bianchi identity, okay, you can do this as an exercise, okay, what you end up with is something with which, uh, which is proportional to the, this z tensor times the fifth strength of, uh, of the two forms, which is suitably defined, and I'm going to define it now. H alpha between Z and alpha is equal to D Z and alpha D E alpha minus D alpha N R A N D A I plus one R X P Q R A D A D. Okay, this is the definition of uh, this tensor. H R contracted with Z. Because this is uh, the only way in which our tensors enter our degree. Okay, only contracted with Z. Okay, now there's an interesting thing here. Uh, vector fields now the vector field signs are combined with the two forms. H M is equal to F M plus Z M alpha B alpha. Now we know that massless two forms, okay, two form fields by consistency must be associated with the gauging from invariance. Okay? Delta B alpha, which we write in this form here, this is the gauge invariance associated with the two form. It generalizes the gauge invariance over one form. Plus something. So there is, there must be, for a consistent definition of a massless, because these are massless tensor, uh, tensor fields, okay, there must be this invariance. This invariance, you see, is uh, this symmetry, this gauge symmetry, is parameterized by a one form. Just as the gauge symmetry, for a one form that is a vector is parameterized by a function. This is parameterized by a one form. This is a one form, this is a two form. Now, what happens is that H must be invariant with respect to this transformation. So, this implies that also the one forms should transform under the gauge symmetry associated with the two forms. Minus Z alpha 
Okay? So we have to assign, in order for this coupling to be consistent, we have to assign a transformation property of the lower order forms with respect to the gauge transformation associated to the higher rank of the means. In order for this to be zero. And you see that if we choose psi alpha appropriately, we can set some of these AM to zero. But not all of these AM are feel this transformation. So not all of these vector fields feel this transformation. For instance, the gauge fields, the true gauge fields, those entering the minimum couplings, which are signaled out by contracting these AM by X7, you can easily see that they don't feel this transformation. Because this is equal to Z alpha psi alpha X7. The X7 is uh, the M is the M of uh, the index of the embedding tensor. The remaining ones, we can, the remaining vector fields, which are big vector fields not participating in the minimum couplings, well, we can uh, dispose of by means of uh, a gauge transformation of the alpha. They can in both be eaten through a so called anti X mechanism by the alpha. Okay? So, um, we can write the general form of the action in terms of these quantities, of these covariant quantities. Uh, let me write down the final form of the bosonic action. I just focus on the bosonic action. So, 1 over square root of g times f is equal to minus r of 2. This is over there plus one half g rs phi d mu and now we have to write d mu phi r d mu phi s where these are gauge covariant derivatives of the scalar fields plus i lambda sigma h lambda h sigma mu 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 divided by 4 plus r lambda sigma divided by 4 h lambda mu nu star h sigma mu nu ok? so the same as before plus L topological B plus L generalized Jensen ok? where L topological B is a topological term depending on B which is uh, minus one half, theta lambda, alpha, b, alpha, f lambda, minus one over four, theta lambda, theta, b, theta. Okay? And, uh, I need to know what's wrong. L generalizes Chen Simons. This generalizes the David Lauer's Lampoonian term. And you see that 
Well, if I compute the variation of this action, which is the bosonic action, okay? This contains only the bosonic field, then I didn't write the fermionic one, okay? If you find varieties with respect to the fields,
On the right-hand side, we have the military current. On the left-hand side, we have a three-form, because this is D or a two-form. This is the start of a, of a one form, which is a three form. Okay. So you see that this is expressed explicitly in a manifestly G combined way. Okay.
H3 alpha right hand side is equal to um, minus Z or theta theta M or if you want star JN. So we can use the gap identity to rewrite the equation for the vectors in this form. But you see, this is nothing but the duality relation between two forms in scalar fields. Because this, these are the neutral currents associated with the global simply generators of the sigma model. So they depend on the derivative of the scalar fields. So these are nothing but the duality relation for the scalar fields. Okay? So you see that we can manage to write everything in a manifestly g covariant way. Okay? Um, now, there is one last thing I wanted to say. Uh, we have written down the variation of uh, the tensor fields under these transformations. Okay. We have written them contracted by Z and alpha because the vector fields, the tensor fields, only appear by contracted, contracted by Z. Okay. However, if we now use this, this variation and we vary H3 of alpha uncontracted, so the corresponding T strength uncontracted. What we see is that we get a covariant H3 alpha, a covariant variation, which is funny. However, plus we also get some, some another term, alpha m beta sum phi m beta, depending on values. So the variation of uh, the gauge variation of the field strength of the two forms has a covariant terms that we like, but something that we don't like, non-covariant, just as for uh, as, as it was for the one forms. Okay? So and this is proportional to a characteristic tensor, which now is not Z, but I call it Y. Okay? It's a characteristic tensor. And has the problem that has the properties that Zm alpha, Y alpha, M beta is equal to zero. So this, when contracted by Zm alpha, is equal to zero. So we didn't see this before. Because before we computed everything contracted by Z, Zm alpha. So if you contract this by Zm alpha, you don't see this, because this is in the kernel of this, of this uh, tension. Okay? However, if you want to write the variation, a covariant variation of the fish strengths of the three form, the, of the two forms, okay? Well, we have to dispose of this extra term proportional to y. How do we do that? Well, we follow the same procedure as before, as we did for the one forms. Namely, we couple the two forms to three forms, and so on. We're in four dimensions, right? We're in four dimensions. We are in four dimensions, yes. But these are forms in space. In space time. So, so these are how far can this go? It cannot go so far. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I promise I'm finishing in a moment. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, no, 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 you cannot because it stops, it really stops at the uh, four, uh, four, four. Okay. So uh, we are now cutting this to three form, which is which is not going to be um, dynamical. But you need it in order for the whole thing to be to be covariant. Okay? So we define H3 alpha okay, as um, D the alpha plus blah 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 plus Y alpha M beta times C3 beta M. Okay, so we couple the two forms to three forms so that the variation of this C3 beta M contains minus phi plus other things 
So you see, the variation of this C3 precisely cancels the non-covariant part in the variation of, uh, uh, of the previous uh, field strength. Okay? So this guarantees that the new field strength defined in this way by combining the old one with the, a three-fold through this tensor here, characteristic tensor, okay, it is covariant. However, as C3 being a, a massless tensor should <coughs> be associated with a symmetry, gauge symmetry, described now by a two form, with the same index structure, plus something else. And the lower order form should transform under this uh, under this new transformation, under gauge transformation associated with the higher order form. Okay? So you see that the here uh, invariance of the theory requires uh, in particular the need to uh, define covariant objects requires coupling lower order form to gain to higher order form through characteristic uh, uh, tensors which, uh, which we call Z or Y which are linear in the embedding tensor you can directly compute Y and it is linear in the embedding tensor Y depends on the embedding tensor is linear in theta and it's obtained from theta by applying some, uh, some uh, uh, through some uh, in, uh, invariant tensor, g-invariant tensor, okay? So, um, it's in the same representation. Particularly, you can verify that y, alpha, and, and beta is equal to theta m gamma f alpha gamma beta plus t alpha m m theta m beta. Okay? And you can easily verify that z alpha z t alpha y alpha m beta is equal to c. Check using the quadratic constraint. You, you find the quadratic constraint, okay? So, summarizing everything, what we find is that if we, by, in order to construct a manifestly G-covariant gauge, gauge, uh, uh, G-covariant formulation of the gauge theory, we need to couple lower order forms to higher order form through tensors which are in the same representation of theta. They are obtained by combining theta with invariant tensors, like this. Okay. Now, uh, the, what we see is that um, the, the Bianchi identity for each form are not satisfied in general. As we see, for one form, the Bianchi identities were not satisfied for all of them but only for those entering the minimal counties. Okay? The others, no. But those for which uh, the Bianchi identities are not satisfied, which are forms which are not well defined, okay? nevertheless, these are precisely those forms which feel the gauge transformation of, of the higher order form. So they can be disposed of these, one, these lower forms, which are not well defined, can be disposed of by gauge transformation of the higher order forms they come up. This is the, the, the main catch. Okay? So, the identities for P forms are not well defined, not, not for all, so are not satisfied, not for all the P forms. Okay? But those P forms for which the identities are not well defined, so sorry, not satisfied, and therefore which are not well defined, they feel the gauge transformation of the higher order forms. And therefore, they can be disposed of by a gauge transformation of the higher order form. 
For instance, those vector fields, which are not well defined because their Yak identities are not satisfied, they are the vector fields along the directions uh, along which the Jacobi identity is not satisfied. Okay. Well, these are precisely those vector fields which feel the, the gauge variation, which transform under the gauge variation of the two forms. And so they can be disposed of by a gauge transformation of the two forms. Uh, if I have two more seconds, I, 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 I just show this for the, for the one pause, and then I, I stop here. Or, or uh, I'm, I'm over time? No, then I will stop here. So this is the main, the main, uh, the main idea, okay? So thank you very much, and I'm sorry for uh, being over time, okay? The anti-Higgs mechanism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for asking. This is what I wanted to do. Well, look, uh, here we have an inflation of indices. So it's very, it's very easy to get lost among with all these indices. However, there is a trick which allows you to get rid of all these indices, okay, and define the essentials. The this trick is called the uh, Rack factorization of theta. Let me do this because uh, it allows maybe to simplify matters. Otherwise, if you, if you read the literature, there are a lot of indices. So we have theta, which is a, a, a rectangular matrix. Okay? Now, any rectangular matrix can be written in the rack factorization. Rank. <coughs> Where I must from one to the rank of this object. Okay, then we have C and N, theta and alpha, theta and beta equal zero. This implies that C and N, psi and I, psi and J equal zero. So this means that this define an isot uh, an uh, um, Isotropic subspace in a symplectic space. Okay, so the number r cannot exceed n one. We know it from general uh, basic uh, uh, symplectic algebra, linear symplectic algebra. Okay, so uh, using this, let, let me let me consider the case in which, for the sake of simplicity, r is equal to n one. Okay. Then we can define a sum dual psi m with lower index psi such that psi m psi m j is equal to delta i j and these are mutually orthogonal. Okay? Now you see that from this definition you immediately define what is the uh, matrix E e minus 1, m and half is equal to psi m i psi m i. <coughs> so this is the this is the, the main symplectic matrix you may verify that it is symplectic that it, that, that uh, uh, brings you to the electric frame and i is what we call the lambda half. Okay, so this is very simple. Now we can decompose the and an into this basis. So writing it as ai plus psi mi ai. Okay? This is just the decomposition in this basis. This is a basis of this linear vector space. Okay? So this way you can do that. So let's write each end now in this basis. This is psi psi m i f i plus psi m i f i I'm just expanding the f part plus now we have the z part plus one half theta n alpha b alpha now this theta I write it using the rank factorization 
And you see that this becomes psi and i eta i alpha pi alpha. Let me call this pi. So now you see that this is just given as psi m i f i plus one half pi plus psi m i f i. From here it is clear which are the vector fields which couple and feel to which couple to the two forms and feel the, the tensor transformation of the two forms and the Higgs mechanism and which do not. These are the electric vector fields. You see, they are not coupled to the two forms. These are the magnetic in the electric frame of the embedded tensor. And these do feel, do couple to the eye and they feel the transformation of the eye. Delta i phi is basically a t psi 1 i uh, plus. Okay? So if I do this transformation, the transformation associated with pi, you see that I can get rid of fi. And then this becomes p prime i. So if I make a transformation, pi and fi, gauge transformation associated with pi, there is an anti higgs mechanism, and this becomes a massive two-fold. <coughs> fi is eaten by the i. This is left alone. So using the rank factorization, you really see what are the electric fields, the true electric field strengths, those which do not couple, which are well defined, which do not couple to the two forms, and all the others which couple to the two forms. They are not well defined, but you can dispose of them by means of a gauge transformation associated with the high rank Okay? And you can play this game with the, all the high rank forms. And you see that all the high rank forms split in two parts. Those which are well defined and those which are not well defined but feel the gauge transformation of the the one, the high rank ones. Okay? Does it answer the question? Sorry, I don't know. Questions at the moment?